and our Redeemer. Amen. We all have boundaries, or at least we should, because boundaries are those things that help us to define what is okay and what is not, what we will accept and what we will not, what is important to us and what is not. They're important, necessary, and they're also one of the many ways that we get to demonstrate love of ourselves. Considering how much love we each pour out daily to those around us, here is just one way that we finally get to return that love to ourselves. In the words of Brene Brown, daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. Our boundaries mean something, they matter to us, and they make a difference. So I think we can all agree that setting boundaries is a good thing. After all, a life without boundaries could lead us into some troubling territory, compromising circumstances, and messy misunderstandings. I'm sure we've all met or come in contact with at least one person in life who has had some poor boundaries that led to some poor choices. Likewise, we've also all met or come in contact with at least one person in life who has managed to maintain very healthy boundaries. And still, if we're honest, we've also all met or come in contact with someone who is so good at setting boundaries that they simultaneously create barriers. Yes, barriers. Those things that act as a fence or wall to prevent people from moving easily from one area to another. You see, sometimes an obsession over boundaries can lead to the formation of barriers which can do more harm than good. Barriers that deny more access than they grant, that close more doors than they open, that keep us comfortable but disadvantage those around us. Barriers that create us and them over there and here that protect our children but discard those from other places, that take into consideration our families yet tear other families apart. One needs only to recall news headlines from this past week alone to understand something about barriers. They are those barriers that stop us from fully engaging anything and anyone that doesn't look like us, dress like us, think like us, or live like us. And friends, if we're honest, we've all developed throughout the course of our lives those protective walls of comfort and convenience that help us avoid what we want to avoid and make a choice to see what we want to see. Boundaries are helpful, friends. Barriers are not. So how is it that we go from building boundaries to building barriers? How is it that we begin with simply finding ways to love and protect ourselves to limiting and pushing others away? How is it that those boundaries become barriers? Now, I cannot pretend that there's an easy answer to this question. In fact, I cannot even conclude that only one answer exists. But I will suggest this. Sometimes in the process of doing what we think is best for us, we develop mindsets that convince us to avoid what is uncomfortable and to run from what is different. And even more than that, sometimes we allow what others have told us or the teachings that we were reared in to instill in us a fear or disinterest in that which is unfamiliar. We label places and people as any number of things, and then we allow those labels to keep us over here and them over there. And it is with this in mind that we enter into the biblical story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Or as the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible titles this section, Jesus and the woman 
of Samaria. Consider for a moment the power of labels. We'll never know her name. She has been reduced to a label that limits her by where she lives instead of who she is. A label that from the very outset creates an us versus them, an outsider, an outcast, this woman of Samaria. But we enter into the biblical story found in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. Now friends, if I could summarize what I perceive to be one of the central messages of this story in just seven words, I do so by calling your attention to verse four of our scripture lesson. It is highlighted right under the sermon title in your bulletin, so you can check to make sure I'm reading it correctly. In just seven words, it reads, but he had to go through Samaria. Now the truth is, on the route from Jerusalem to Galilee, the shortest distance possible required you to pass through Samaria. It was literally the easiest way to go. Yet it was most common at the time for Jews to take the longer, indirect route east of the River Jordan through Perea because of their distrust and dislike of the Samaritans. It's a lot like maybe going from here to Greece, for example. And instead of choosing the straightest route, which will take you down and through Clinton Avenue, we instead go a little bit out of our way to hop on either 590 or 390 North to get to our destination. Now, perhaps it's because the expressway is a little quicker or because we wanna avoid the traffic lights on the way. But maybe it's also because we want to avoid the boarded up family dollar, the fenced in basketball courts, the restaurants with papers in the window, people walking about in the middle of the street in the heart of the city. Perhaps friends, that is a Samaritan like space that we too avoid. Now I've only lived in Rochester for about a year and 10 months, so to understand that, I definitely had to call on the expertise of some of my colleagues who have lived in Rochester far longer than me. And what I realized in those conversations is that even here in the city of Rochester, there are spaces and sections of town that we have grown accustomed to avoiding. Maybe, just maybe, we have our own Samarias right here in Rochester. But friends, instead of avoiding it this time, Jesus takes the straightest route to get to his destination and he makes a choice. He goes through Samaria. And it's on that journey into and through what has been socially deemed as other, as distrustful, something to dislike, to fear, to avoid, that he encounters one with whom a beautiful exchange of love and truth takes place one who would soon become a carrier of the good news, a friend. But before we get there, the text tells us he had to go through Samaria. For whatever reason, on that day, Samaria could not be avoided. And if I can be honest, verse four confused me a lot. Because knowing that there was in fact another route, that there was a different choice that Jesus could have made, I just kept wondering why was it such a necessity for Jesus to break custom, deviate from tradition, and interrupt the status quo just to get to his destination? And the more I pondered the question, the more interesting it became. Because I think this was an attempt to do exactly that. To break custom, to deviate from tradition, and to interrupt the status quo. But why do I think that? How exactly did I arrive at this line of thinking? I'm pretty sure at least one person in here is asking yourself one of those two questions. And I'm so glad that you did. <laughs> so let's keep reading. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting 
by the well. I think it's safe to assume, therefore, that one of the reasons Jesus makes this decision is because he's quite frankly too exhausted to take anything but the shortest and straightest route to get to his destination. We can all agree that that makes sense because the truth is we've been there. After a long day of work or school, the last thing you wanna do is sit through a million traffic lights on your way home. Trust me, I get it because fewer things irritate me more than traffic after a long day of work. But friends, if we consider Jesus' track record, if we take into account what he's done in other situations, if we reflect on the heart of the gospel message, we can also reason that Jesus makes this decision to make his directives to us clear. The necessity of passing through Samaria, the decision not to just pass through but to also engage, his interaction with the Samaritan woman throughout the rest of the story, and the significance of their conversation happening at a well. Yes, a place from which you draw water, but also a place symbolizing and representing community and coming together. All these things work together to tell me one thing. Jesus is in the ministry of breaking down barriers. Only one who is interested in deconstructing us versus them or those people over there and any other kind of language that keeps those barriers up would approach the journey to Galilee by passing through unchartered territory. And if I can use my theological imagination just a little, I imagine that Jesus asked himself a question right before he began this journey. While leaving Judea and considering all that lie ahead in his ministry, maybe Jesus asked himself, what can we do with these barriers? Barriers that are preventing the formation of community. Barriers that are privileging some over others. Barriers that prefer custom and it's always been that way to opportunities to engage in Christ's call to all places including the people that don't look like us, dress like us, think like us, or live like us. What are we called to do with these barriers? Friends, that is the question that I believe we must also ask ourselves today. What barriers exist around us or in our world that prevent the love and light of God from being shown all around us? What are those barriers that we have told ourselves are simply boundaries that cause us to avoid and choose which people we will see? What are those barriers that we have been called to break down? Again, one needs only to watch the news, read the newspaper, or skim through social media timelines to learn something about the barriers that exist in the world around us. There are plenty of things going on that we sometimes avoid or maybe even turn a blind eye to that Jesus is calling us closer to. That call to break down barriers is a call to get closer. Because the more proximal we get to a thing, the closer we become to helping to address those things. And in our text for today, I believe that's the first thing that Jesus teaches us. As we consider the question, what can we do about these barriers, Jesus says, get closer. By making a conscious decision to pass through Samaria and in actuality to sit and engage a Samaritan, Jesus gets closer. Now, I'm not necessarily asking you to physically move or go anywhere. Some of us might be called to that, but many of us are not. Proximity is not limited to that kind of movement, though. Proximity is also about choosing to build and engage in relationships, to foster and build community, and to cross cultural boundaries from time to time in order to make that happen. And a trip through Samaria was an opportunity for Jesus to do that. So who is Christ calling you to foster relationships with today? What cross-cultural boundaries have you been called to cross? 
In a time where we see barriers that alienate people on a daily basis, raising awareness and playing it safe is not always enough. We are called to engage in relationships with those around us to foster that community with people that are like us and people that are not. But friends, we can't do that if we only get close enough to what is familiar and avoid everything else. Jesus says, go ahead and interrupt the status quo, get closer. But not only does Jesus call us closer, <clears throat> but as we consider the question of what can we do about these barriers, the second thing Jesus says is speak. As the story progresses and we are given opportunity to eavesdrop on the conversation between Jesus and the woman of Samaria, we find that not only was Jesus willing to go through Samaria, but he was also willing to speak and to speak up. Where custom and tradition would shun and look down on this very encounter, by using his voice, by engaging in conversation out in the open, and by speaking to one to whom he has been taught to avoid, Jesus teaches us something about proclamation, that act of saying something in a public, official, or definite way. That means when we see things happening around us that we know aren't right, we're supposed to speak up. When we witness or realize the barriers that have been put in place, it's not enough for us to shake our heads, to be silently outraged, or to only talk about it amongst our friends. We have to find ways to speak loudly, to proclaim what needs to be proclaimed, and then to utilize our privilege to advocate for change. And sometimes we have to be willing to be seen speaking out. After all, isn't that what Jesus does with the Samaritan woman at the well? So I ask you, what issues have you felt God calling you to advocate for? What are those things you feel called to speak up about that you've been silent about for too long? I know there are some things that I want to be better about addressing myself. Because even when it is uncomfortable or scary, I too must deviate from tradition, do something a little different, and say something. But friends, we're not only called to get closer, and we're not only called to speak up, but we are also called to give. Passing through Samaria was a bold move. Speaking up and speaking to a Samaritan, especially in public, was a barrier-breaking move. But even in an effort to go one step further, Jesus also gives. This woman does not walk away empty. In fact, she leaves with more than she had when she came. And I think that's a powerful reminder for us all. Our interactions with people, our attempts to break down those barriers, our cross-cultural experiences should be about giving and sharing what we have to the point that no one walks away empty. Yes, we can give of our resources. Yes, we can give of our time. All of these are wonderful gifts to give. But friends, I'm not just talking about charitable work. We can also give and share love in a radically community-focused and justice-centered way like Christ. Because giving, friends, is also about being willing to give something up. We all give of our resources and our time regularly, and I think we should, but sometimes in gifting these things, we must also give up those mentalities, those opinions, those perspectives, and those biases that cause us to both intentionally and unintentionally criticize and judge those we help. We have to give up the mentality that living in poverty is a choice, that people can simply pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that hard work and a college degree are the keys to success for everyone, that people who live in certain areas or neighborhoods are automatically dangerous, deviant, and destructive that only some people deserve a job or to make a livable wage, that we are somehow better than anyone else just because we've been afforded better opportunities. We have to be willing to give something up. 
because we cannot enter into or engage Samaritan-like spaces and still hold on to those perspectives because they hinder real relationship. But friends, let me be clear. While we are not all called to do it all, we are all called to do something. And even more than that, I do believe we are all called to break down barriers. We do so by changing our mindsets, by seeing people as people, by setting aside distrust of things that are different, by choosing to pay attention and engage instead of turning away from those things that don't affect us directly. Breaking down barriers is work that is available to each of us. And it's work that I know that we can do because we do so many great things already. I think we just have to be willing to ask ourselves a few questions. Are we willing to pass through Samaria? Are we willing to engage a Samaritan at the well? Are we willing to break custom, deviate from tradition, and interrupt the status quo in order to let God's love and light shine in every way? Friends, what are we going to do about these barriers? Now, I'm calling them barriers, but the word injustices works too. There are those we talk about often, but consider for a moment a few others as well. Whether it's the issue of mass incarceration, the disproportionate rates of incarceration among people of color, the criminalization of the mentally ill who are thrown into prison instead of being given the help they need, the school to prison pipeline, which has allowed us to prepare prison beds annually based on the literacy levels of kids in the third grade or issues of access to health care, proper retirement packages, and jobs that pay everyone a livable wage, or even the 400,000-plus reports of missing children by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or the issue of women's rights ranging from Me Too to equal pay, and issues of representation and diversity in every facet of our society. These issues are not just in the world out there. They're right here in Rochester, too. There are barriers all around us. And I think it's up to each of us to figure out which ones pull on the strings of our hearts. But don't stop there. It's also up to each of us to stretch those personal boundaries just a little bit further to see beyond what affects us directly. And then, friends, once we've figured that out, I think we must join Christ on that radical journey to building community, to breaking down barriers, and to letting the love of Christ truly be revealed. Maybe we can start as early as today. May it be so. Amen.